both in this session and the next session we'll do a little bit of introducing Lexio Divina which I think is a perfect way uh, in terms of what Bishop David was saying about taking the scriptures into our lives. Lexio Divina is a method that we can use with any scripture um, just to take it into our lives, to let it soak into our being and let our being respond to God through the, the, um, the text, and in this case, the text of Psalms. And we'll look at Psalm 19 a little bit in this context. So, uh, just firstly to say, all right, we, we think of the Psalms as prayer, prayer to God. We also need to remember that the Psalms now, because of their place in the canon, are the word of God. We could have a reading from the Psalms and we say, this is the word of the Lord. And, you know, so they are, they are also the word of God. So they work in both directions. They're our words to God, but they're also God's gift to us in the scriptures. And I think that two-way thing is really very important. When we come to look at poetry, we're looking at deeply expressed emotions, and we'll see that in the Psalms. <coughs> Hebrew poetry, one of its great characteristics is its brevity. Now, Hebrew is a very succinct language anyway. It has prefixes and suffixes, so in one word you can have a whole sentence. So it's a, it's a succinct language anyway, but in other ways it's even more succinct than English. So when you hear it in the Hebrew, it's even um, briefer. It's language which is ambiguous and multi-layered, and it's the ambiguity and the multi-layeredness that we need to unpack sometimes to even understand the text and certainly to be immersed in it and engaged with it even more. And then, of course, we have beautiful images and sometimes not so beautiful images in words there. And the images transport us into another uh, engagement with God. Just when we're looking at poetry, um, here's a very old, from 1897, a very old uh, definition, which I think gives us a lot to think about. Um, it says poetry has well been well defined as measured language of emotion and I think we know that from all sorts of poetry. Hebrew poetry deals almost exclusively with the great question of man's, because it's written in 1897, but human's, all of ours, relation to God, with guilt, condemnation, punishment, pardon, redemption, repentance. They're the awful themes of this heaven-born poetry. So it's poetry about the matter of life, you know, and the things that we experience deeply in life, like guilt, like condemnation, like pardon, but also the wonderful things like joy and, and thanksgiving, and the Psalms are full of that as well. So all these deep emotions that we experience and that sometimes in church we're a little bit too stiff and restrained and the Psalms tell us to embody it. You know, you don't just feel somehow in this, you feel in your whole being. And if you're filled with joy or thanksgiving, then that comes out in your body as well. So the Psalms invite us to a ho the whole person in many ways to respond. Um, Easton does go on to say, in the Hebrew scriptures there are found three distinct kinds of poetry. The book of Job and of the Song of Solomon, which are dramatic, that of the book of Psalms, which is lyrical, and that of Ecclesiastes, which is didactic. didactic. Hebrew poetry has nothing akin to that of Western nations. It has neither meter nor rhyme. Now, I, 
I, I disagree with him in this estimation. It, it doesn't have metre and rhyme in the same way it's traditionally been important in English poetry. But that doesn't mean it's got nothing to do with Western poetry because all poetry touches in to the, to the depths of, of our um, feeling. So I think it does have, but it doesn't, it has a certain amount of metre, although the, the Latin and Greek scholars tried to push it a bit too hard into the very regular metre of, of Latin and Greek poetry. Hebrew poetry has a certain metre, but it's not absolute and doesn't usually have rhyme. So um, he's, he's right, but his great insight is, is here, I think, in this part, where he's really uh, telling us that Hebrew poetry is touching into all these very human experiences. I suppose I would have encouraged him to list joy and thanksgiving as well. Saint um, Athanasius of Alexander, on the other hand, gives us a very short saying about a psalm, which is essentially poetic. A psalm is a mirror in which you contemplate yourself and the movements of your soul. And if you think of a psalm that way, you read a psalm and you allow it to... to um, well, you allow yourself to ruminate on it. I think ruminating, I don't know whether we have too many rural people here, but you know the way cows chew over and chew over. And, and that's what the invitation is with Psalms. And Athanasius suggests to us that in that process, we will see ourselves and maybe see ourselves more truly and more deeply and of course in that we are encountering God because as Mark told us earlier we are made in the image and likeness of God so that in that journey inwards we are also encountering God. Just to have a look at a few of the characteristics of Hebrew poetry um, it does have some rhythm, I've said n enough about that. It has this wonderful thing that they usually call parallelism and we'll look at it in a few, it, it, just in a, a couple of slides. It's also very succinct and I've talked a little bit about that. It, it's nearly always emotion there and then it has this great thing of assonance which is lost in translation, so lost to us. but we have to, to recognise that the sounds of the words are part of what conveys the meaning. Um, and, but we are working in translation. So Robert Elter says with poetry we're using the best words in the best order. And he reminds us that compactness and repetition are really the essence of Hebrew poetry. When we talk about parallelism, this is the sort of thing, this is the basic thing that we're talking about. We talk about three sorts of parallelism. And if, if you have a Bible, if you have it open at Psalm 19, and we'll see the examples as we go along. The essence of parallelism, and I will explain it in the form of synonymous parallelism because it's both the most common and the easiest to understand. It's saying that in a verse of Hebrew poetry, you have two parallel statements saying not exactly the same thing, but at first it may appear the same. Okay, so with, verse, uh, with Psalm 19, sorry, the first verse reads, The heavens are telling the glory of God. And the second half of the verse, the parallel to it, and the firmament proclaims his God's handiwork. So it seems to be saying the same thing twice. And we all know, especially educators, the importance of repetition, but not exactly saying the same thing, but the same idea. However, scholars are learning today that there is there is a change in the second half. What appears to be simple repetition is often a great development or intensification. 
So verse 1 of Psalm 19 again says, The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament... I'm sure you all know your, your Hebrew Bible cosmology. This is the firmament. And that's how they thought of the world. So this is the heavens. This is the earth. There are pillars under the earth. And there's water under here and up here. And how do you know that? Because water comes up, doesn't it? Springs and all those sorts of things. And how do you know there's water up here? Because it rains or it snows or it hails and, and it comes down. So the storehouses are up above. I, I'm not trying to laugh at their cosmology, but that's a simple way of, of describing it. We know now that we go out into universe beyond universe. It's a, our cosmology is quite different. And in a couple of hundred years' time, people may well laugh at our cosmological understanding because it changes and, and it has to change. So the heavens and the firmament are pretty much the same thing, although the heavens can in include whole lots of other things. And of course we have the, the sun and the moon and the stars here underwoods, underneath. So the heavens includes all of this, not just the, the firmament there. So that's what this is talking about. It's talking about the sky, the heavens. Um, and it says, the heavens are telling the glory of God. And when we look at the parallel part, it says, the firmaments proclaim. Now, to tell is one thing. To proclaim is a, is a bit more intense. The, the firmament proclaims his handiwork. So God's glory here is described as God's handiwork. And this, in part, is God's handiwork. We are also God's handiwork. But this, this isn't talking about us so much. But God's handiwork, it's God's creative activity. God's glory is not just some otherness, that transcendence, which is part of God, but it's also God's handiwork, that imminence, that, that engagement of God. And that's, that's how this parallelism is working. It's saying, once you start to unpack me, one verse of one psalm, once you start to unpack me, there is meaning, layer upon layer of meaning here. So it's not just looking at this objectively, but it's seeing it as something, as God's handiwork. God's, God's actually the creator. Now, I'm not trying to be literal with this. So it, it's the image it's creating. But that we know an artist through their art. And this is something of God's art, God's handiwork, God's creativity. And that's what this very beautiful psalm invites us into. And that's what, oh, now I have to swap again, um, that's what synonymous parallelism is, what we find in that first half of the, um, the verse. Oh, that can stay there, can't it? Um, I'm just learning about this new board technology. So that's, that's what synonymous parallelism is doing. That's how it's operating. The two halves of the verse are playing off against each other. You know, is anyone here um, a percussion person in an orchestra? No? You know the great symbols. Now, you can't play a symbol with one, can you? It doesn't do anything. That's what parallelism is. It's like you've got these two symbols and they play off each other and the meaning intensifies and multiplies and that's what these scholars are saying. Alter says 
biblical parallelism resists full-scale synonymity. They're not exactly the same. The two halves of the verse are not saying exactly the same thing. There's an intensification, there's a change. Or Berlin says they forge oneness out of two-ness. But the two halves are saying one magnificent thing. Or Kugel says A is so and what's more B, the first half and the second half, or a hundred sorts. So that when you clash these symbols together, you get a hundred meanings, not just one plus one. And he says, but it's not three. He's just toying with the idea there. So that's synonymous parallelism. The second one, antithetic, we find in 19 verse 11. And here the, 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 the meaning, uh, the context has changed and changed quite significantly and we'll go back and look at that in a minute. But it says, moreover by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Now first of all we have to say, well what are them? And that's what's being talked about from verses 7 to 10. And it's the Torah of the Lord. And it goes on in verse 7, the Torah of the Lord. In verse 8, the precepts of the Lord. Um, verse 8, the commandment of the Lord. Verse 9, the fearing, fear of the Lord. Verse 9, the ordinance of the Lord. Them, all those teachings by God. So that's what the them are. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So that's where we get the antithetic. They are opposites. One, one is talking about warning, one is talking about great reward. And it's, it's by the contrast that the parallelism in antithetic parallelism, it's making the point or, or conveying the meanings via contrast rather than by similarity. And then the, the third type is a development where you get it, it unpacks it a little bit, usually in three parts of the verse. It's rising, talking about the sun, is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them and then a, a further development and nothing is hid from its heat. So they're the, the, the three major sorts of parallelism. You'll read all different sorts of material on this. But that's what's happening in poetry. And I think because of that, you need to meditate upon psalms. You need to take time with them. You need to ruminate over them. You need to allow them the image to really unpack so that you hear not just one symbol being played, but you hear the mighty crash and all the reverberations that come from that. So the Psalms require your engagement, your attention when, they're, um, when you're meditating on them. Just to say a little bit more about parallelism, and here he's talking about, um, again, the, the um, synonymous parallelism, the first one we talked about. He says the second line is either more emphatic or more particular or um, more figurative, more symbolic in that way. So that's just a little, a, a little guide there to help us with the parallelism. <coughs> William Brown, um, in his thought, he's, he's citing C.H. Dodd, captures the impact of metaphor, and that's the other thing that we have when we come to poetry. We've got metaphors that abound, and it's metaphors that really draw us into, and we'll see, make us think. So a metaphor or simile drawn from nature or common life arresting the hearer by its vividness or strangeness and leaving the mind in sufficient doubt about its precise applications to tease it into active thought. And I think sometimes we feel with scripture we're not allowed to think. And that's not what the scripture says. 
Mark was telling us right at the beginning of scripture in chapter 1 and chapter 2 we've got two different creation stories. Surely that's saying to us think about these things. With the Gospels we've got four different Gospels, three of them um, with a lot of similarity, the three synoptic Gospels. That's saying to us think about this they're not simple repetition. There are differences that are important, that are part of revelation, that are there for us to, to meditate upon and to think about. The scriptures invite us to think and to think critically about things because your questions will take you more deeply into the scriptures if you honour them. To question scripture is not to dishonour it. To question scripture is to engage with it and to allow it to take you further ultimately into the life of God. Because that's where scripture takes us and that's the invitation Bishop David was offering us earlier. To allow the scriptures to become part of us because they do ultimately take us into the life of God. And here he, he's saying that the metaphors provoke our thinking and that's our engagement. Because if we just, if we just take the scriptures and we don't engage with them, we don't move with them. But once we start engaging them, with them, we're changed and we begin to hear the scriptures differently and I think that's what Bishop David is referring to in the more we meditate upon them the more we're taken into them and again as I say ultimately the more we're taken into the life of God Brown also suggests that if we absolutize a metaphor then we make it an idol. And that's what the literal, too literal a reading of scripture does. We turn the text into an idol. And very often the metaphor is misunderstood by being taken too literally. We need to guard against literalizing them. We also need to be aware that in our society we are awash with images that are intended to manipulate us. That's the aim of advertising. Advertising in all its sources aims to manipulate us. If we engage with a metaphor if we linger over the metaphor, as William Brown suggests here, then we really enter into the theological um, engagement. We really enter into it and that entering into it takes us away from this manipulation and allows us really to be open not to the idol but to God. So the way we read this poetry, the way we read these metaphors is very important for us. Okay, let's take a great example in Psalm 19. I don't know whether any of you had the chance to read this psalm before you came. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to read it for all of us because I think when you're doing scripture you have to read the text. It's no good talking about it if you don't read it. So um, I don't even want to ask your forgiveness for reading it. I'm just really telling you why I am. It begins, To the leader, a psalm of David. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. 
there is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuits to the end of them and nothing is hid from its heat. The Torah of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So we have in this psalm, firstly, I think, beautiful poetry. It's only when we get to the end in verse 14 that it really becomes a prayer. It's directed there to God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And we have to say, well, what, what's going on in this psalm? What is this psalm about? It's one of the three Torah psalms that we come across in the Psalter. So Psalms 1, which we'll look at uh, later, Psalm 19, this psalm, and Psalm 119, which is the longest, by far the longest psalm in the Psalter, and we won't look at that at all. This psalm has, oh, but it's a beautiful psalm. S lots of people write Psalm 119 off, but if you meditate upon it, it's a beautiful psalm too. But So this psalm seems to be in the heavens, and then it's talking about Torah. And I, we'll have even a different way of looking at it in a little while. And you think, well, what have they got to do with each other? And some scholars have said, well, maybe they're two psalms that have just been put together. I don't think that's the case, but that's, that's what some have said. So in the beginning, we've got all these things in the heaven, the sky, the firmament, the sun. Um, it's universal. It's a, re a revelation to everybody. We are up. Don't, don't flick the thing, but if you could just look at this board for a minute. We're up here. Um, at the beginning of this beautiful psalm and it feels like a creation psalm, doesn't it? And even the way it speaks, um, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, night to night declares knowledge. When you look at the skies, when you look upwards in the daytime or in the night time, there's a message, they're proclaiming something, they're speaking to you. And then in verse 3, it, it must, the poet must have that thought. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. This is a literalist, isn't it? The heavens don't literally speak. And then the answer in verse 4. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Maybe we do it more with the night sky than the day sky. 
but sometimes even just to stop and ponder the clouds in the day sky. The heavens tell forth God's handiwork. And this psalm is really praising that reality. It's really taking that reality to heart. Then it becomes very specific. It's still in the heavens, but it moves. It shifts in the, um, the second half of verse 4. In the heavens, he, God, has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy and like a strong man runs its course with joy. And you think, what on earth is this talking about? What's, what's this idea of a tent for the sun? Why might we need it? Why, why might they even talk about a tent for the sun? Hmm? Well, the, the sun disappears for half of every day, doesn't it? Where does it go? Into its tent. <laughs> Now, again, we've got a different cosmology operating. We won't flick the big screens, but if you can just look here for us. We've got a different cosmology operating, but the sun sort of comes, disappears from view of the earth, then it's got to run all the way around and come up and rise again. Do you, do you see what's happening? It, it's disappearing. It's going into its tent each day. And it comes out of its tent like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy. Now I've never seen a bridegroom come out of his wedding canopy but you can imagine, can't you? <laughs> hey? The bridegroom's been with his bride all night in his wedding canopy, comes out in the morning, you know. Bright, and that's, that's how the sun comes out. It's, it's glowing, it's full, it's light, it's every, you know, all of that wonderful thing. And like a strong man runs its course, and it's got a lot of work to do because it's got to get from here somehow to here. Now, we know our cosmology is different. We know we've got a round earth and we know we're puny and the sun's much more important. But that's not how they thought. That's not their cosmology. And that's what's happening here. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And nothing is hid from its heat. When the sun is in the sky and especially coming from the land of of Israel. I'm from Melbourne and we have lots of cloud and um, I love the variation there but in Israel the, the sun is pretty intense for most of the time um, and nothing is hid from its heat. You can't escape it. So this sun that's ruling the day and so you think Okay, so we've got the heavens talking about proclaiming God. We've got the sun, you know, running around here. And then all of a sudden in verse 7, we're talking about the Torah of the Lord. And I, I don't like law as a translation. The, the Hebrew word there is Torah. And I don't like law as a translation because Torah can mean teaching, instruction, so much more. It includes law, but it, it shouldn't be translated. All of a sudden we're talking about the Torah of the Lord, which is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure. The, the way it speaks about these Torah, these teachings, the Torah of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. What revives your soul? Is it, is it God's scripture? Is that what revives your soul? I have to say it does revive my soul. But there's an invitation to us. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. Again, an invitation to allow God's decrees, God's teachings to make us wise. The precepts of the law are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
And then in verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold. Your concern for gold there earlier. Even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. So we've got this piece of poetry that's up in the heavens and then all of a sudden we've got these other verses that are about God's Torah which is desirable, which is life-giving. And we have to say to ourselves, well, what's the relationship? How, how are they operating together? And I, I know you can't read this and I'm not worried that you read it. It's the text of the psalm. And it's a visual image of what's going on here. Oh, I can reuse this little. So up here we've got the heavens. Down here we've got the earth. And the, the Torah or God's teachings are a ladder in between. So there's a pictorial element to this psalm that is bringing the two things together. And so what, what happens up here and what happens down here are related through God's teachings. They're related to one another. They're linked. Not only are they related through the ladder, but they are related in terms of colour. Because we've got the sun up in this part. And we've got the Torah down here, which is aligned with gold and with honey. The colour of the sun, the colour of gold, the colour of honey. All related to each other. Similar, not exactly the same. But do you see the way the poet has worked so magnificently to bring all of these things together? So with Psalm 19, we look at the genre. What is it? Is it a hymn? Yes. Is it a Torah psalm? Yes. It's both, I think. Um, some say it belonged at the autumn festival, but it certainly brings out the relationship between creation and Torah. Both bring light, both represent order, both represent God's design, both speak, and both are God's work. So this psalm is, is beautifully woven together. It's like a rich tapestry. And it's only when we take the time to unpack it a little bit that that, that richness really becomes evident. It's like looking at the back and seeing the, the back of a tapestry, which is well done. And the back is almost as rich as the front, isn't it? And that's, that's what's happened here. You know, light, light in the heavens. Well, certainly from the sun, but also from the moon. The light that Torah brings, the light, the enlightenment it brings for, for living. I, I think, um, well, I'm a sister of Our Lady of Sion, as um, you were told at the beginning. And our founder says that God speaks to us in three ways. That God speaks to us in nature that God speaks to us through the scriptures and that God speaks to us in our heart. And I think this psalm brings those three things together beautifully. We're invited to really to encounter God in the sky, which is part of nature, we know. Maybe most often at night we do that. We go out into the, to the, the night time and we look at the stars and we can't help but um, be drawn towards God. And maybe there's an invitation to do that in the daytime as well. Did you want to say something, Charles? <coughs> My first encounter with God was when I was six in the great uh, north sky, which was a light blue colour. All the stars were hanging down full moon, right at the North Star was there, and I 
reached up to that sky and experienced the Almighty. Ah. Thank you, Charles. Yes. 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 Thank you. So, different ones who are encountering God. Um, there's someone up here who are, who have encountered God in the in the night sky. I think the harder invitation is to encounter God in the Torah because that takes a bit of work. When you, this gentleman here. I have another way of voice. I'll need a microphone. This is what she's offering you. Yeah, well. I just want to give an example of what you said is true. Many years ago, and long ago, I like to think back. It's not working very well. Mm -hmm. Is that any better? Yes. Yeah, I was uh, travelling from Kirinabarabu to Wabiga. I had a motor truck. I was on the railway. And I was driving this motor truck. And I just got through the one bungles, and it broke down. And I had to push it for several miles. I couldn't get it going. So eventually, I got off the, the railway line, and there was no trains for a day. So I had to camp that night. And I just laid down, mainly for that. Uh, had me corn, had a bit of roll of corn beef in my back. Had that for dinner. And I just laid down. I was a Catholic. I was a practicing Catholic, but not a good Catholic. And I just looked, and what you said is true. I got close to God in my life. That's as close to God I've ever been, even today. Wonderful, you too. Thank you very much indeed. So we, we're all um, at one with, with encountering God in the, in the sky, and especially the night sky. This psalm is inviting us to go further. It's, it's almost easy to, to be aware of God, to encounter God, to be overwhelmed by God with the sky, especially the night sky, but even the day sky when you're out and it's beautifully blue and the clouds are there. That, that, there's something that touches in our soul, in our being, and, and calls us, reminds us of God, and calls us to, to encounter God. This psalm starts there. And then it takes us more deeply into these revelations by God, God's design, God's work. The scriptures are also God's design and God's work. But they don't, they don't overwhelm us the same way in the beginning. But they do overwhelm us with the presence and the power of God when we take time with them. And I think that's the invitation that Bishop David was offering us earlier this afternoon to allow the scriptures to really overwhelm us the same way that the night sky or the changing seasons can, can do. They are so visual and, and so present. The scriptures require a bit more effort on our part to go into them, to read them to start off with, but then to search to understand them. And so this psalm is, is really addressing some of that. It's taking us into a, a space where we know the power of the sky. We know that the sky speaks of God, even without words. And that plays with that speaking and, and silence. And we know the power of things that speak 
without words so often. But it's also taking us into knowing the Torah of the Lord as reviving the soul, as making wise the simple, as rejoicing the heart, as enlightening the eyes. They're profound, profound things. And then in verse 11, in some ways, the, the movement um, is then to the self. Moreover, by them is your servant wa warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So it turns to self-reflection then. And a certain amount of self-questioning. And it ends with those beautiful words. Verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The meditation of my heart, either of the night sky, of the seasons, or of God's teachings, God's Torah, God's scripture. Okay, it's time for us to break now. <laughs>